Jim Guerrero here with SCN Insights, and I'm pleased to have with me today a special guest from California in Wildcat Discovery, John Jacobs. John, how are you? I'm doing great, Jim. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for joining me. You know, we've known each other a long time since you were back here in Michigan, and we've always had a, a fun relationship, but you made the big move to go out to California, and I wanted to see if you could just give us a quick overview of your background and, and your story, what led you there, and then maybe we can talk about your company, uh, Wildcat Discovery. Okay. Well, let's see. So my background, you know, so I'm a, I'm, I'm clearly a Michigan, Michigan man here. So my background is all Michigan until I came out here. Uh, engineering. So I started off, <clears throat> started off at General Motors and Ford, various engineering roles, and then I, uh, I later got an MBA and switched to the dark side of sales and marketing, and that's where I've been ever since. <laughs> um, that's actually when I when I started to interact with you. I think was after that that change, yeah. and but that you know that that combination. Um, like in the recruiting world, the combination of a technical degree and, and an MBA is really powerful. I mean, that just opened all kinds of doors for me personally. So I started moving around a little bit. Um, I worked for Material Sciences Corporation back in Michigan for about eight or nine years. And then uh, what led me out here was my my boss, one of my bosses in Michigan, Mark Dresser. He was kind of courted to head out and be the CEO of this company called Wildcat in, in San Diego. And he was out here, I think less than a year, six months or so. And he texted me a picture of the sky. So back in Michigan, I think it was around, you know, <laughs> March, probably the grayest, the um, grayest month of the year. And that's saying something in, in Michigan. He texted me a picture of the sky uh, which was blue and said, <laughs> if you're ready to make a move, I got something for you to do. And so we talked about it. It was, it was a big decision for me and my wife. Our kids were, were younger, six and nine at the time. And so we kind of viewed it as something where you don't get many chances to kind of land on your feet in, in Southern California and give it, a, give it a go. So we held on to our house in Ann Arbor. We made the move to kind of see what it would lead to and uh, no regrets. It's uh, you know it's different than Michigan, but it's been it's been a good move. And Wildcat's a great company, so I've been out here yeah, about ten years now. I, I couldn't imagine that that transition. You had young kids, young family, and your wife was obviously supportive, which is a, a huge part of anybody that's successful in business. They have to have a good good better half, whether it be a husband or a wife. And yeah. there you are. So. You have a traditional automotive background, which is, is certainly served you well, but you made the move into the, the broad stroke battery space and the material space. Can you give me and give our viewers an overview of the overall battery sector and how it works and what your role and what your company's role is in that in that space? Yeah, let's see. I mean, that's 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 a big, wide open question there. But I guess let me, uh, I guess I'll summarize it like this. So, you know, interestingly, when I joined Wildcat, it was actually Wildcat was founded to work on hydrogen storage materials of all things. And uh, I got out here, and the very first, you know, my job is to go get business. So I ran back home to Michigan. I knew all the automakers and said, "Hey, we got this great technology. We can find." all these great materials for hydrogen storage way faster than anyone else in the world. What do you think? And they all said, sounds great. Come back and visit us in like 50 or 60 years when we're more serious about hydrogen. And so <laughs> what, what really happened then is our company shifted. We switched into lithium ion battery development. Um, we have an accelerated means of trying lots of experiments in parallel. Probably talk more about that later. And, uh, and so the world of lithium ion though back in you know circa 2010 was interesting even even then the automakers were 
they were they were giving lip service to it, but none of them were real serious about it. I think they were all just kind of sitting back watching to see if the industry really took off. And, so, and that's frankly what gave Tesla the ability to, to get in and, and have some success is none of the other ones were real serious about it until, you know, the last few years. And so back at that time, our focus at Wildcat was, was mainly on electronics companies. So, you know, um, the companies making and selling phones and laptops primarily. And so one of the, one of the statistics I like to give to people to tell them like just how significant the battery market has changed in the last few years is three or four years ago, if you added up all the world world's needs for batteries, lithium ion batteries for, for every phone and laptop you see, which is a lot, everyone's got a phone and they did even three or four years ago. If you, if you total that up and under, you know, any metric, materials, cells, watt hours, whatever, it was roughly equal to what the EV market needed at that time, which was interesting because, you know, three years ago, you didn't see EVs on the road, but there were still enough of them that, mm. that they equaled the world of electronics. And that's just because a car uses a heck of a lot more batteries than a phone. Now the the EV market is five times larger than the electronics market. Wow. And so that has shifted the dynamic. You know, companies like Apple and Samsung and and you know all the, all these big companies doing electronics for for decades, they would tell the the battery industry this is what I want and they would all jump and do it. And now increasingly these companies are turning their attention to the automakers cuz you know, they go for the bigger fish. So they're focused mm. on automotive needs now primarily, and the electronics uh, companies are, you know, to some extent, they're second fiddle to the automakers now, which is, it's been an interesting change. It's an interesting place for them to be. They don't want, <laughs> normally uh, take second fiddle to anyone, do they? <laughs> no, uh, you know, when you're, <laughs> when you get used to being the king, you don't like, being yeah. told to wait or you know you, you don't get priority over others so but it's you know it's an evolving market and the the electronics market i don't mean to underplay it it's still a gigantic yeah. market all to itself so there's still a lot of activity sure. there too well <clears throat> who could have predicted you know 15 years ago 17 years ago the tremendous movement towards electrification in the vehicle space. I mean, I think, you know, it always seemed like a good idea, but the, the reality is the science of climate change has really uh, taken off, in, you know, globally. And that's driving really the, the electrification movement, right? You know, and the, the scarcity of fossil fuels. So... I mean, it seems like they're, you know, the vehicle sector, the car makers are going through this, this stage of, of transitioning and, you know, it seems like a good idea. Mary Barra has made proclamations that they're committed to electrification and, you know, it all makes sense. Now well, let's see if they can do it cost effectively and, and we'll see if the dollars, you know, are there because, you know, they have to make a profit as well. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, when you asked who could have predicted it, you, you, you reminded me of kind of a funny story. So there's, there's a few guys and companies running around selling industry reports. And these are, you know, these are prophets who claim that they have crystal balls and they can see the future for, for batteries and everything. Um, and so there, there were two guys of note, though, who were kind of at the, at the lead of that business. And everybody bought reports from these guys. And they're still, they're, they're both great. We've, we've purchased reports from them. But the two are really different. There was this one Japanese guy, and he was just, he was always predicting this wave, this hockey stick growth of, of batteries for EVs. And it was just two years away. And every year it was just two years away, two years away. <laughs> and, and so he was like this optimist that just said, Oh, it's coming. Just hold on. And then this other guy based in France was the pessimist. And he was always saying, Oh no, 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 no. It's, it, it's going to take time. It's going to take many years for this market to really evolve. And so for five or six years, the guy in France was right. He was, and he, and he, 
he sure liked to talk about it. Yeah. You know, he would he would bring up yeah. this other guy's forecast and show how his was accurate. But now it's funny in the last three or four years, he's on the other side of it now, where he's he's um, you know under predicting the market by a factor of about two each year, and then the next year he doubles his market, and so he's now playing catch up. So. You know, in the end, both those guys are right. They just their timing was off a little bit, and it's it's yeah, really and, hard and, to predict. And Governor Newsom, of yeah, California and, and, and Governor Newsom of California by recently, by recently made the proclamation that by 2035 that so, only new vehicles um, would be electrified. The fifth biggest so, economy in the globe um, made a pretty significant fifth biggest economy in the globe made and a pretty significant proclamation. And I would think that that bodes well to your company. And you know, I would think that that bodes well to your company. You know, with all the emphasis on in the electric world. Yeah, it's you know it's um it's been it's been interesting to watch these when when you talk about climate change and all that. You know, I'm not I'm not necessarily convinced that alone was why suddenly people started buying car or EVs and things like that. I mean, certainly for some, and probably the early adopters, they did just to to take a stand. But this was one of those cases where government subsidies and things, which often fail, they're often off, they, don't, they miss the mark. Um, that's, you know, to my, you know, my opinion, it actually worked this time. It started in China where the, the Chinese government was heavily subsidizing the battery industry to get these guys to produce stuff on, at really low cost. And then it's since picked up in other places like Europe right now is the hottest area of battery growth in the world. And the same dynamic that happened in China a few years ago is happening there. And I predict in the United States, you know, sadly, it will be will be kind of the last one to follow suit, but I think it will happen here too. But that 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 is what enabled the cost of batteries to come down dramatically. Um, four or five years ago, it was not a profitable industry, despite Tesla and others selling EVs, that none of them were making any money on them. And that's why I think most of the other automakers sat back and were waiting. But now the cost of batteries has plummeted. And it's because, you know, it's, it's that old adage, we'll make it up in volume. There, there's some truth to that. I mean, that volume has gr- gotten to the point where the cost of batteries is remarkably lower than where it was just four or five years ago. And now it's now it's it's just tipped on the other side of profitability, and everybody just runs to the market. So, and it and it's going to drop more. And so, I think the market's here to stay. Anyone who makes an announcement now, like like uh, Governor Newsom or others, sure that's going to help the industry. But even without that, it's become profitable. Whether it you know you want to buy cars for the greater good or not, it's a profitable mm-hmm. industry, and so it's going to grow at this point with or without those announcements. Oh, that's that's great to know. I I didn't know about that. The so the batteries themselves, there is an economy of scale that has been achieved, which make which makes them cost uh, effective for the car makers. I mean, it's it. It, it's cost effective. So if you think of Tesla, you, you can kind of, it, they're not a bad one to watch just from a distance to get a feel for what's happening in the market. You know, their early cars were over hundred thousand um, dollars mm. and they catered to a very niche market. Now, now you've got the model S and the model three specifically that's in the mid $30,000 range. And, you know, yeah. I, I don't know for certain, but they're probably around break even or maybe even make a little money off those. Not much, but that's a far cry from a hundred thousand dollar car where they weren't making any money and now suddenly they're there. Mm. And if you watched Elon Musk battery day uh a month or two ago, they talked about plans to get to do some things to cut the cost further and get cars into the twenty thousand dollar range where they're still making money. So that's at you know, at a high level, that's that type of cost reduction you're seeing and that's all enabled by what's going on at the fundamental level inside a battery, which is what Wildcat works on. So there's going to be a huge initiative for the infrastructure as well to keep up with the electrification movement, charging stations in garages, charging stations along highways, in parking lots, in urban areas, corporate offices, and so forth. How long are we away from that movement, and what's going to drive that? Is it going to be the 
the government subsidies as well or the government you know tax breaks to to get those infrastructure projects in place or is it going to be more of a capitalistic endeavor where people see an opportunity and a need to provide charging or is it going to be a combination how is that going to play out well i mean i my my hunch is the latter at least in the united states i mean the, the united states is more entrepreneurial still than anywhere else in the world and so if there's if there's an angle or a way to make money people are going to come out of the woodwork and they're going to figure it out so um i mean i personally don't know as much or much about the, the charging infrastructure things that's not something i focus on or what our company does so i'm not i'm not really the best one to ask there but you know a, a step down the supply chain from there is just the fundamental need to make batteries for for this demand that's coming and that's a little closer to what we do at wildcat and so even there um, if you look at what the car makers are now saying, here's, here's my roadmap for vehicles we're going to launch over the next 10 or 15 years and the need we're going to have in terms of just watt hours, which is, you know, kind of a general way to talk about a, a, an energy need in terms of batteries. Um, it's, a, it's a form of capacity. You can think of it as a, for, for cell plants. The, the plants that exist today are woefully, inadequate to supply what the automakers say they're going to need 10 years from now. And so you, you have these companies like Northvolt in Sweden, which is really, you know, doing a lot right. And Innovat is another one that actually Wildcat has partnered with. Um, they're based in Slovakia and there, and there's three or four others in Europe who are just popping up overnight saying they're going to build these gigafactories, which are on par with what Elon Musk did in Nevada all to support just the European EV car industry. So, you know, for me, I'm, I'm more focused on how in the world are all these cell plants going to come online fast enough to supply the demand. That, and then how you charge all those batteries, that's, an, that's another problem all to itself that I'm just not that knowledgeable about. But I assume yeah, it's going to fix There's going to be a huge amount of disruption in, in the energy sector, right? So you can't just you know, move to batteries and then keep powering uh, power plants with natural gas and, and coal. You know, there's going to be a big movement towards renewable. I mean, renewable. The, it's like, it feels like the it Wild is, West in, in the car industry. Is, I mean, the car industry that has been, it, it's unfair to call it stagnant, but there, there hasn't been a disruptive thing like EVs in the car industry for, I mean, not no, that I can remember in my lifetime. No, it's... Suddenly, it, all this stuff gets, everything related to combustion engine just gets thrown out. I mean, think of all the opportunities people have to go make money now. There's batteries, there's charging, yeah. there's data. You can set up things using yeah. solar and wind and renewable sources yeah. to create energy to charge the cars. How you yeah. manage all this gazillion things of information and data flowing out of the cars up yeah. to the cloud. I mean, the cloud is another one. So it just yeah. doesn't end. And then people want to take all this stuff and create AI and machine learning and all this this stuff. There's money to be made there. So I mean, there, there's just endless opportunities within the realm of batteries. It is a com it's a com it's a complete disruption, unlike we've ever seen. And and if you and if in in, in whether we call this industrial revolution number five, you know, that could be a discussion in itself, but. The last 20 years have been the big tech revolution, right? You know, the, you know, the internet, the, the phones, the cloud, all of the data storage, etc. And that's going to power a lot of this upcoming industrial revolution, I do believe, you know, with all the networking that takes place within a vehicle, within a manufacturing facility, certainly the, the power and the energy disruption. This is going to be the next huge change and we're just starting to feel it and anytime there's change there's going to be a little bit of anxiety and 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 fear and so forth but it's coming it's happening fast and it's going to be a wild ride i totally agree in terms of the actual material wildcat your company what specifically do you do in terms of the battery development and and how 
what value does your company bring to the table? What are, what are the benefits that you offer to the battery marketplace? Well, okay, so what, you know, our company supplies a service. We don't sell a product. So I guess that's the first thing to make clear. Um, the, the, uh, the idea behind our company is pretty interesting. Um, our founder is, uh, one of our two founders, is, his name is Pete Schultz. He's a, he's a pretty famous guy in the bio, bio uh, the chemist, the, the life sciences world, I should say. And back in the 90s, he had this idea um, he came up with where if you, if you think about how the body fights disease, your immune system, if you will, if you, if you get an infection, your body just basically creates millions of antibodies. It doesn't know which one's going to work and it throws it at the disease until one of them takes root. And somehow your body knows this and it, and then it reproduces it. And that's how you fight off infection. And so his idea in the nineties was, why don't we do, rather than do drug discovery, one thing at a time, why don't, we're starting to have robotics and automation and things that are out there. And actually some, a lot of it from the car industry um, can we develop a way to using liquid handlers and fancy stuff, let a scientist test thousands or even a million molecules a day to fight disease. And so he developed this equipment and things, hardware that enabled this concept and it became really successful. It was later adapted by the oil companies and others for catalysis and, and similar things. Then there was a pause. And then with Wildcat, it was like, okay, can we, why don't we try the same idea of parallel research, but do it for renewable energy, initially hydrogen, but more for the bulk of our existence batteries. So um, it's not millions of things a day, but this is what we've come up with. So we've got a lab full of secretive hardware and, and technology we built with a big team of engineers that allows us to do parallel experimentation, way more than anyone else can do. So the value that we provide and the customers we work with, it's anyone who does R&D on, on the materials that are used inside of a battery. For the most part, the rest of the world does it kind of the old fashioned way, the way it's been done since the 80s at Sony who started it, which is people in lab coats, hands in a glove box, doing one experiment painfully manually at a time. They make a small battery similar to what you would use in a watch or a calculator, and then they cycle it, you wait a month or two, you draw a conclusion and then you do a second experiment. But this is why, you know, this pace of, of experimentation is why your iPhone Jim, is probably going to die before we end up uh, finishing this conversation. I mean, it's not <laughs> good enough. You want it to be better. With Wildcat, that same scientist can do hundreds or thousands of experiments. In fact, you know, in a given month, we're doing many thousands of experiments, all different in parallel that's the key is different you know a battery guy a battery company can crank out a million batteries a day all the same but if you want to change the materials in every single one of those batteries that's hard and that's what wildcat has figured out how to do so these companies that we work with whether they're big chemical companies big companies that make cells like the batteries themselves or the car makers and the big electronics companies they come to us and We'll take maybe, you know, five or 10 years of research they're aspiring to do, and we'll crank it out in about six months. And so they That's pay us to speed it up. We share the mm. spoils and uh, everybody benefits. That's incredible. And not only is it a more efficient and a more profitable way to arrive at a, an outcome for technology, it's a great contribution to society because the batteries are, are really the centerpiece of the electrification movement. That's, that's a, that's a good place to be. Yeah, it, you know, it is. And I, it's funny. I, I, I think of Detroit and Michigan often because it, you know, back home in Michigan where everyone seems to, be, to work for an auto company, you, you take, you really take it for granted, the level of automation and, sophistication in the car plants. Um, everything's done the same way. You know, the standard deviation on any little step within a car plant is very small. I mean, it's very methodical. In the world of chemistry, it's not really that way. Um, you know, si chemists in the realm of batteries and probably in other industries, they're doing experiments by hand. There's a lot of manual things, which for, for a lot of chemistry, that would be fine. But in the case of a battery, 
it, you know, there's, there's hundreds of variables within a battery that you make. And at the end of the day, that's all you care about is what does this do inside of a battery? Well, my point is manual experimentation as it's done in pretty much all these companies is just fraught with the opportunity for variation, which then clouds your conclusions. It makes it hard. So just, so going slow is one problem, but then the experiments you get and the quality of that data is another problem when everything is done by hand. By introducing automation and robotics into this process, it not only speeds it up, but it improves the quality of your data a lot and therefore your conclusions a lot. So that, this is, this all, flows into the value proposition that Wildcat has, and that's why people, you know, basically come to us to, to help them out. So it's not just a, a good conversation, and it's not just good ideas that you guys have come up with. You also, in the past year, had a serious announcement about investment and capitalization because there are believers in what you're doing and there is really good traction with your penetration and, and growth in the marketplace. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I, uh, so we, we've had, we, we just did a third round of fundraising late last year and, and that's, that's only three rounds of fundraising in, in over 12 years, which is a long time. I'm, I'm smiling because I'm thinking of, you know, this, the startup, company of wildcat which is run by mark Gresser and and i'm here and it's these midwesterners and the and you know the one of the differences <laughs> we've had versus all these other startups we meet on the west coast is we are stingy cheap people <laughs> I mean, we don't want to raise money we want to we want to make it on our own and so you know yeah. you, if you come visit us we don't have a fountain. We don't have these fancy chairs or the stuff that a lot of startups spend their money on and then quickly go out of business. We're, we're scrappy. And so um, we've, we've kind of managed to make it for a long time. But the, this recent announcement that you, I think you're alluding to from last year was really exciting. Um, we, we raised a little over $20 million last year. You know, it was one of these things where technically we didn't really need to raise the money. Um, we were doing okay. We're bouncing around break even with what we've been doing. But the reason we raised it is our business model, we added a twist last year. It's mainly been the service I've been talking about. But as companies that have worked with us have come to believe in what we're doing, inevitably they've asked, well, can I have what's behind that curtain back there and buy your whole lab for myself? And so for years, the answer was no, this was our proprietary thing that we really don't want to share. But we've decided now to open the discussion up to selling maybe three or four or five systems to um, a few big companies around the world. And we're close to our first deal of that kind now. So the real purpose of raising this money was to get a jump start on that. We, we've got this awesome high throughput technology, this hardware that lets us do this rapid experimentation. But it was never really intended or dressed up to be sold. It was very functional, but it just, you know, in a lot of places it was a little kludgy. It worked fine for, as, cause we knew how to use it, but if we were gonna sell it as a product, this whole suite of equipment, it needed some polish and it needs some improvement. So that's what that money was intended for. Um, and our lead investor is a fantastic company called Flint Hills Resources which is, is, is an interesting story all to itself too. This is a company that, that plays in the combustion engine uh, realm. And that's where they've made you know, most of their business. And so you, would, you might ask, well, why in the world would they invest in Wildcat who's, who's working on battery technology that could displace that? The main reason was is that this was an industry they've used as potentially threatening to, to their core business. They didn't really understand mm. it. Wildcat had this bird's eye view of the industry. We work with everyone. We know what everyone's really doing, where the industry's headed. And so they viewed us as a really nice one-stop shop to quickly get an assessment of, of the industry at large to see if they, they might actually have products that'll be synergistic with this move into EVs. So they were the lead investor in that round. And, um, and everything related to that and, and shifting the business to making a second set of this this equipment we use is going great so far that's awesome so what's the future 
in your opinion? What does it look like for Wildcat? What does it look like for the battery sector? You know, what percentage are we in right now in the total movement towards electrification? Uh, well, you know, you can read the the predictions, like I guess, like I can, Jim, about how how long it'll take before everything's EVs. You know, I don't know that it'll really ever reach that point. I think there's always going to be markets and niches where a, a, a gas vehicle might be just fine and it's not going to go away completely. Um, but I think you're going to see uh, a real rapid move to EVs for a lot of people over the next 10 years, and then it'll start to level out a little bit more. But this fast growth, based on everything I read, looks like it's the next 10 years is really when it's going to go crazy. Um, you know, for Wildcat specifically, so having venture capitalist investors, you know, our, our mission from day one is always to get them to return on their investment, a big return on their investment. So to some extent, we have to think about how we do that, you know, it, whether it's a true exit, like they sell the company or an IPO or a SPAC, which is, which have become very popular just this year. Um, these are all possibilities, and you know we're looking into those things, and we're interested in those those you know all of the above. Um, so we'll see. But the trajectory of Wildcat, you know, I would say in my time there for ten years, for the, for the first year, but you you mentioned my supportive wife earlier. Well, she <laughs> she is supportive, but for the first year, she was like are we done yet? Like, are you guys selling that company yet so we can go back to Michigan? So she stopped asking me that, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we're, it's, it's an exciting time for Wildcat because never, never in my time here have we had so many different paths to some form of liquidity event. And so it's coming. It's, you know, I think it's, it's going to happen soon. What was that last thing you mentioned? A spat? Is that what you described? A SPAC, yeah. So in the battery industry, there was a company, um, it got a lot of a lot of attention called QuantumScape. Um, Volkswagen and Bill Gates were investors in this company. Mm -hmm. And so they went public through a SPAC, um, a, a couple, actually, I, I don't know that it's even formally completed yet, but they announced it like a, like a couple months ago. Um, and so a, what a SPAC is, is basically... Um, it's a group of people who basically you're, you're kind of betting on a management team. So they go out to the public market and they say, we're going to raise money. Here's my new company. It's called, it's called Jim and John uh, battery company. You notice I put your name first there, Jim. Well, you know, J and J, how about that? <laughs> it's alphabetically correct too. So J, J, J and J. Uh, and, but, you, you don't even necessarily have to say what you're going to do. It's, it's kind of a crazy idea, but you, you basically mm. just say, we're going to, we're going to raise this money. We want to, we want to go IPO and we're going to take in all this money from a public offering and we are going to use it to buy another company, but we're not, we cannot tell you who that is or what this is about. But even with that little information, these things are allowed to go through and they work. And so if, if people believe in J and J, they're going to say, well, I don't know what those two guys are up to, but it, it's going to pay off. So I'm in. And so then you have to take those proceeds and buy this other company. You can't, you know, you, we can't go skiing together or anything like that. You got to actually go follow through and buy a company. So that's what they did. So they, they basically acquired this company, mm -hmm. QuantumScape. But what that does is it, it enabled them to inject roughly a billion dollars of capital into that entity, which is, you know, gives them a huge runway to basically go figure out everything they need to do to, to get to the end. Yeah, especially if it's committed. That's hilarious, though, that Bill Gates went out and raised money. You would think that he might be able to dip into the coffers himself and, and get it going. No, he, he didn't raise money. He, he oh. contributed money. Oh, he was one of the investors. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. I was going to say, all right, thanks for that. Yeah, no, clarification. I think he's doing, I think he's doing just fine, Jim. I don't think he needs to raise anything. Yeah. He's, <laughs> he's doing okay. All right. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Um, but, but obviously if you get a notable investor like Gates or Volkswagen, that puts a lot of teeth behind it. Um, well, and that's frankly, 
not to take anything away from Quantascape, they, they've been very secretive, so I don't know for sure what they have, but they probably have something really good. But without a doubt, one of the things that helped them achieve that success was the Volkswagen investment and then Bill Gates mm-hmm. as an investor. Those are two heavy hitters backing your company. And so a lot of people were willing to take a, take a, a bet on them just for that reason. That's interesting, too, because Volkswagen's coming off, I believe, the diesel engine controversy with reporting emissions with Bosch Automotive. And uh, it's interesting that they're still, you know, operating with a, a, a good brand out there. Um, in any event, um, you've given a, a pretty good overview What's interesting is that you touched on a lot of different things. You know, the the technology, the science of your company, the the varied approach to reaching scientific uh, uh, conclusions within the battery space. But then you you blended in some good old fashioned Midwest engineering and automotive you know, conservative business practices. And it's been really a winning combination. And it's fun to see the way that you guys have grown and and taken kind of a multifaceted approach and and also some good market timing with the growth of electrification. It's going to be interesting to see how things uh, pay off and and, and translate into the future. It also would be curious to see what the likelihood of success is going to be with Jim Harbaugh leading your your proud uh, football (laughs) program. And if you have any future predictions, you know, this would be the good time to to get it out there. Oh, man. uh, No predictions. (laughs) Oh, I got predictions. I, I, in fact, I hope this is being recorded and, be, and you brought that up because it is being recorded. Michigan pounds Notre Dame and it's just around oh. the quarter, Jim. We're going to go back to those decades <laughs> of just domination over the Irish. And when that happens, oh, I'm going to play this back for you. This is locker room material. I, I hope, why don't we send this video to Jim, the other oh, Jim? Oh my, oh my goodness. I, I never, you know, what a sales guy you are because you just totally deflected it and put the onus back on me here. So that was good work on your part. Um, what, what, what do you want me to predict? The outcome, which game? Michigan? I want to predict the outcome of Jim Harbaugh and his tenure at Michigan. I want to know what you think is going to happen. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, he's, Michigan historically gives people a little more time than I'd like to see. So Brady Hoke and Rich Rod and all these other guys, they, they seem to, they, they all seem to get a year or two more than I expected. And so with Jim Harbaugh, I feel like he's given the the name and the clout and his tie to Michigan and all that. He's going to even have a longer rope than those guys did. So I don't think, I don't think it's over. Um, you know, I mean, he's got a tough, he's got a tough gig there, Jim. I mean, the the problem, the, the based on everything I read, which you know maybe it's Jim Harbaugh propaganda, but he he takes, you know, he and Michigan take the academic side seriously, and so that just puts that puts the school in. The, it's not the same as the SEC, and so that makes it a little That's bit true. more difficult for him to attract the same type of uh, players that those guys get to get. And, and I think his focus is not simply on just winning a game week to week. He's actually, he cares about the, the players. He wants them to walk away with the degree they have for the rest of their life. I think he really does mean that. And so it's kind of apples and oranges. I'm deflecting again, but uh, no, I don't know. I think, a fair answer the mission of the university is a big part of that discussion right it's not win at all cost and there's something to be said for that that's right and and i mean you know that's why we're talking today are you having interviews with anyone from uh down south? i'm not going to name specific schools because my sons oh, are man. still <laughs> i am not going to go there 
I'm not going to go there. We have got very fine uh, representatives from all over the country. Heck, we're on the run here. Do you want to give any more? Do you want to give some political prognos prognostications or, or, or forecasts as well? No, don't answer that question. <laughs> don't answer. <laughs> So, but hey, John, I really appreciate you joining us. It was actually, uh, it was a pleasure and we learned a lot of good stuff about your company and the future of the, of the battery sector. And it's gonna be exciting to see your progress. Thanks again. This is Jim Guerrero with SCN Insights and John Jacobs with Wildcat Discovery. Thank you for joining us.